This, this book uh, quite a few times, but I never tell anybody the title of this book. And I do that on purpose because, let me see if I'm on here. Because of the title of this book, it would be taken uh, wrong. So I'll show you the title of this book. You probably can't read it from that, can you? No, I can't. Okay. Sex as Symbol. It's by Dr. Alan Borchka. One of his, to me, it's one of his magnum opus books. It's a, I, I never ever tell anybody what, it, what the title of it is. And it's not about what you think it's about. So, uh, But it is about some of the things that I've been sharing about the balance of power. And the balance of power is the balance of the male and the female, which is the balance of your brain, which is the balance of the Ash and Asha, which is the balance of Adam and Eve, which is the balance of right and left, which is the balance of good and evil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, just, you, know, you just continually can go on and on and on with that. And uh, religion has so uh, uh, brainwashed us and caused our thinking to be awry that it's hard to go back to the foundations. It's hard to get back to those places where we need to be. So let's just open, if you have a Bible, open your Bible. And uh, is there another one over there? I wonder if Tony Celeste could look at this. You, you, you won't believe it. If you do, even if you see it, it's going to be still hard to believe. But uh, you can actually see it with the, if you have a King James translation, you'll see it clearly. Uh, I don't know if these are King James or not, but uh, really what I want you to do is see a word or several words. And the reason I use the King James is not because of its accuracy. I don't use, it's just because of its popularity. That's all. Just its popularity. Uh, and most of our modern day translations are drawn from this translation either way. And so, uh, but if you have a, a Exodus turned in your Bible, Exodus chapter 25, and we looked at this verse last week, and uh, I want you to look at this verse again with me. Uh, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40. You see it there? It says, I can't hardly see with these, at least my work glasses, and I use these because they don't fall off my head when I'm working. But I can't see as good with these because of the, the bifocals. They're, yeah. they're wrong here. Now, get down there. So, anyway, verse 40. Everybody there? And look thou, make after the pattern. Now, I want to put this word pattern up here because the importance of the word, it's made, it's spelt from the Hebrew tall, which is actually the last glip or character in the alphabet. So there's 22 characters in the alphabet. The olive is the first. The tov is the 22nd. And so the tov has a value of, of 400. And I'm going to do this because of gematria. I just want you to, to uh, see the, how gematria, how numbers, numbers are important and they, uh, they, they speak, they share things. This is the Beth, which is the second glyph. Uh, that's called the Non, uh, which is the, uh, is the, has a value of 50. This is called the Yud. Or yud. You remember when Jesus said, ever jot and tittle? Jot in Hebrew is a yud, which means it's the smallest character. It's the smallest character, but it symbolizes male and female because it has a value of 10. Okay? So, and then you have this glyph again. <clears throat> total, okay, 400. And so, actually, if you total all of these numbers together, this is the number that you'll come up with. Number 7. And so the reason I do seven is, of course, the stick man. The stick man is a picture of you and me and uh, who we are. All scripture is about this character right here, the stick man, right? I mean, it is. You start out with seven, you close with seven. It's just woven everywhere you look, all the way through scripture. And so when you look at this word pattern, that's the Hebrew word pattern. 
it has a geometric <coughs> value of 7. That simply would say you are the pattern. You're the plan. You are the manifestation of what God is. I, I know that's really difficult for people who have been brought up in Christianity, hardcore Christianity. It's hard to grasp that because you have been taught to measure yourself by the standard of religion. Not by who you are, not by what God created you to be, but you have been taught to measure yourself that way. And notice he says, but, uh, he said, verse 40, look thou and make after the pattern which was shown you in the mountain. And I want you to look at this word, mountain. This is, I, I gave you this word last week, this is, this is the, the hay, and the hay has a five value, and this is the rash, which is the symbol for fire, and it has a 200 value, and when you do gematria on it, you get the same thing. Do you understand what I say and how I'm doing that? Can y'all follow how I'm doing it? The way I get Gematra is I reduce everything down to its smallest number. It'll always reduce down to 1 through 9. And 1 through 9 is always the pattern in Hebrew. It lays the pattern for everything that exists in this dimension. So if you can learn what each one of those characters represent, 1, 7, etc. If you learn what each one of them represent, you realize there's a pattern in that. It's amazing how this pattern, it, it can't be made up. It's just, I mean, you couldn't even run it through a Dominion counting machine and screw this up. <laughs> you can't. Because it, it's perfect. I, I mean, and so when you see this, and I, and I want to do this for you again, uh, because he's, the idea, he's, he's up in the mountain, or the idea is just exactly like God gave this idea to Abraham. And he said, look at the stars. So when you're looking at the stars, if any of you were up this morning early, like say if you was up between 6 and 7, the moon was phenomenal. I mean, it was, it was just a tad over a half. It was straight up this morning between 6 and 7. It was just straight overhead. And I mean, it was just beaming with splendor and glory. It was just beautiful. Astrology, it, it, you know, in Christianity you're taught to shun it, right? Stay away from it because it's demonic. But I want you to uh, look at this because we're talking about the pattern and uh, I'm just going to do this. This is Aries and this is Libra. And the reason I'm doing Aries and Libra, Aries the sign for Aries is the sign of the ram. And I, I say this over and over and over. The sign of the ram is the sign of your upper brain. It's the sign of your two hemispheres of your brain. That's what, and as a matter of fact, in astrology, if you're looking at, if y'all maybe not familiar with this term, Adam Kidmon. Adam, the word Adam Kidmon, K. K-E-D-M-O-N, Adam Kiedmon. Actually, that word means the man in the sky. That's what it means. So, if you're familiar with this term, as above, so below. You're familiar with this term, the Mac, M-A-C, macrocosm, and the Mic, M-I-C. You're familiar with those terms. Those are all hermetic terminology. And all it's saying is that out there, the whole star system, the whole the galaxy and all of the signs that are drawn in those, they don't really draw that, they, have, they give those depictions, that's all they are, they're depictions because the compilation of all that puts a certain energy at a certain time on the earth that has a certain creative ability. So when you see Aries, and uh, uh, you're understanding this is the Adam Kid Mon, this is what, this is what he looks like. Now, if you can see that, upside down, that's the child in the womb of a woman. 
but it's really not. It's actually a man in the sky. Aries is the head. That's what it represents. That's the head of a baby. This is the neck. This is Taurus. This is the back, right across here. Taurus, the back. Then you have Gemini. You have the two arms, the twins, etc. You come all the way around and you come to Libra. Libra is the balance. It's the pelvic. And there are all, there's two sides to Libra, just exactly at, for your extension of your legs to come out, right? So you have this, this up here, you have this right here, and that gives you a left and a right, period. And yet, if we get out of balance, if we, if we become all masculine or we become all feminine, we get out of balance, then our power is not balanced. And that, that throws everything out of kilter. And so when we learn, as we learn, to balance power, as we learn to balance these powers, these abilities that we have, we have these innate. And of course, you know, if you follow this on around, uh, this child, he has, uh, this is where the head and the feet in Genesis chapter 3 come together. One bruises the other. And, and it's a, that's a poor terminology. Like when you read scriptures, you see things that are really poor, poor terminology. They're not, they're not, they're not the way that they should be. And so the reason that I'm using these numbers, Har the Mount, uh, the pattern, both being seven, both having this, and do you know what this part of your body is right here? This part of your body from the top of your head to your sex organ. What do you call that part of your body? Do you call it the torso? The torso. Huh? torso. The torso, correct. Do you know another word for the torso? Another word for the torso is the core. Right? It's the core of your being. Another word for the core of your being is your heart. See, if I can get you out of thinking, your heart is that part of you that pumps blood through your whole body and get you to thinking that the core of your being, your heart, is from your sex organ to the top of your head, then you will not eliminate certain organs and say they're really dirty or nasty or they're less valuable. Hello? Mm -hmm. To see there's nothing more valuable or less valuable than your heart, which is your core, from Aries to Libra. Now that doesn't mean that your legs and your feet aren't important. They are a very important part of this structure. They are the mobility of this structure. But the core of your being, the heart of your being, that which gives you the ability to experience, that which gives you the ability to think, to feel, to taste, to smell, that's your core. That's your heart. And so this book is a book that's about that. It's not a book about history. It's a book about the mystery of God depositing itself in you and me. Not only did it deposit itself here, it created us to be that housing or that, that vehicle that gives it the greatest expression of ability that can be. Period. It's you and me. And so as we begin to see that, as we begin to realize how phenomenal we are, and that, that means everyone. And so I want you to go with me up to another passage over here in Genesis chapter 2 which we looked at, I think we looked at it last week, I want you to look at this with me. This is the first place this particular word is found in Scripture. And it's not what you think the word is. You can read this Bible from most any translation, and when you read this word, you will think another word. Yeah, that's true. That's true, I'll show you. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 22. Genesis 2 and verse 22. It says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. Now, what you think when you read that is you think that God took a rib out of Adam, didn't you? And created Eve. It didn't say that. But that's what you read. That's what you thought when you read that. But it didn't say that. Actually, it says that God took, the word real actually in Hebrew should be translated for the word sail. It says that God took a sail out of esh. 
out of ash. God, God takes this sail out of ash. And actually, ash comes from the Hebrew word ish, which is the word for fire. That's the root of this word. And the, and the first place you find this word woman, it, right there, is it. That's it, right there. It's the first place you find this particular word woman. And this particular word woman actually is, it means the womb or the birthing place or the incubating place for ash. In other words, a seed, as Bruce was talking about the logos. In other words, a spark of light. So you have a spark of light, which is a seed which has a creative potential to create whatever, period. You might like it, you might dislike it, but it will actually be the source of your own creation. Because if you begin to take a thought, which is a, which is a spark of light, you begin to take a thought, you incubate that thought, you can actually produce that thought. As a man thinketh, so is he. See, this is how the whole thing, and it starts here at the head, in the core, in the heart, and it works that way. This is the first place that you find this word woman. It's not Eve, it has nothing to do with Eve at all, and every place you find this word is used like 246 times in the, in the Old Testament alone, woman. You won't find Eve that way at all. I think Eve's only used two or maybe three times in the whole of Scripture. Old and New Testament. But the word woman is used like 200, almost 250 times. And it's always this word, eshah. It's always the womb of fire. Or it's always the creative aspect of God in your physical body. So it doesn't matter that you're a male or a female, man or a woman. You all have this esh and eshah. Everybody. Doesn't matter who you are. So you're all both male and female. Period. It's hard for us to comprehend that because we lack, we lack basic teaching and basic understandings to try to grasp this because we are created to balance this power of thought, the male, the female, the ash and the asha. And it's the balance of that. Do you all know what happens when you get balance? You get harmony. And not only do you get harmony, you get peace. And so, I don't really know anybody that's not looking for that. But don't know how necessarily to find it. And so these are just simple things. And, you know, and for me, the scripture has become a literal pictograph of these things. I see it everywhere on all the pages. I don't see religious garbage anymore. I don't see, I don't see history. I don't see, I don't see great men or great women or this or that. I see pictures of me. Pictures of us. Pictures of you and me. And these pictures, they just become so phenomenal. They, they just, uh, the way God has put them together. So go with me to a passage in the book of Deuteronomy. You're close here. Uh, it's uh, the fifth book in your Bible. Just flip over there real quick. The book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 4. chapter 4 and I want you to see this verse verse 24 everybody there it says for the Lord thy God is a what consuming fire God is a good now that's what God is so in other words when you look at the sun you know what a sun, the sun is S-U-N the S-U-N you know what it is it is a consuming fire you look at stars, what are they? They're consuming fires. They are. In other words, they are balls of light, energy. And all the, all the, the energy of itself it consists of. And this word fire is just spelled this way. It's Aleph Sheen. And then the word that we used over there for man, I just want you to see these correlations of these words so that you can see that how that one builds the other. The word for man. Is the. Esh Yod Shin. So the word for man has the Yod. It has that. Male female attribute. And then. 
the word for woman. I told you this is the same word that goes all the way through Scripture for the word woman. It's the same as the word for fire, but it has a, this is called a hay. That's number five. It always means it has feminine energy. In other words, it has the creative aspect about it. It has a womb. It has an ability to procreate. Now, if, you, if you're just watching, it's really easy to look at these words and see the similarity. So, is God, since it's a fire, similar to man? Since man is the offspring of that? Absolutely. What about woman? Absolutely. It's the same thing. And so, all it has is different attributes. So, different attributes through those names gives it different different abilities. Now another scripture let's look at it right here. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And you've all heard this passage of scripture. You've heard it. But you haven't heard it. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean when I say that? You've heard it, but you haven't heard it. Now watch what I, watch what I mean when I say that. And you'll probably say, yeah, I, I heard it that way. It says in verse, uh, look at verse 3. Chapter 8, verse 3, it says, And he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna, which you knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make you know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. All right, now, if you're looking at a King James Bible, look at it real close and tell me what you see. Word is a Word is a So it doesn't even have word, the word word in the original Hebrew. doesn't have the word word. Because you see, and this is a popular verse of scripture. I just said everybody knows that. Every one of you have heard that. Man can live by bread alone, but man can't live by bread. He lives by the word of God. And so automatically what you do is you draw a picture of an anthropomorphic God, some kind of an old gray-headed man, and he's telling you all this stuff. He's speaking these words out. That's not what that passage is saying. That's how you read it. You know why? You and I have been taught to look at it that way. And if you'll notice, it's been added. It's not there. So what does it say? It says, but by, by every that proceeds out of the word mouth shouldn't even be there. But what's the next word? Of the Lord. Oh, it doesn't even say God. But every one of you... When you read that, you automatically went and said, out of every word, out of the mouth of God. It don't even say God. What does it say? The Lord. Lord. Now see, here we are. We do, you say, but brother, land, the Lord is just a synonym for the word God. No, it's not. It is not. Matter of fact, it's first introduced in Genesis 2, 4. It's the first place that you'll see that word. And it's this Hebrew, Yod, Hey. Bob, hey, and I could say it this way, it's fire, earth, air, and water. I could say it this way, it's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. I could say it this way, it's the four elements, the four basic elements that builds as the building block of everything that lives in this planet. So when it says that this proceeding thing that comes out of the Lord who is the Lord? Could you say I am? You could. Because you are the Lord. It didn't say anything about God. There's not any mention here of Elohim. Because Elohim is the word we translated for God. But Elohim actually means the astrological wheel and all of its powers. It comes from the root word El. Which means segments of power. Like for instance, if I took this one segment right here. Aries. I could, I could say that that was, the Hebrew word would be Alif Lamid, El. El. Or all. Either way. <laughs> what does that mean? Power. Well, when I put all 12 of these together, what have I got? Powers. These are the elementary powers. When you look at Hebrew, Hebrew's broken down this way. It's broken down into three Seven and twelve. 
gives you a total of 22. It comes from the three which builds the three mothers. Those are the three divisions of this 12 wheel. In other words, this circle is divided into four segments three times. These four segments are yod hay vav hay fire, earth, air, and water. And it repeats itself three times. It's called three mothers. It's also called the triune God. It's also called Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. All of these, it doesn't matter what religion you go to, wherever you go, it don't matter. They all will say exactly the same thing. They're all speaking about you and me. Because all of us are this manifestation that's here to experience the good, the bad, the ugly, the up, the down, the pain, the happy. We here, how many of you have felt any of that? <laughs> well, I do. And if you will look real close, you'll find out where it comes from. It doesn't come from out there. You know where it comes from? Within your own being. You create your own world. You cre we create our own habit. How do we do it? By the proceeding, that which proceeds out of you, which is your word. That's how we do it. And it's like uh, Kirby said uh, something when he came in about, about his word and about the word. Uh, hope that uh, hope that they don't all come to pass. I, they don't. Thank God they don't. You know, many of them fall by the wayside. Many of them are choked by the cares of this world and different things. But they don't. Thank God in it. Too. But those that do are a product, are a part of our own manifestation. And so, what does that do? What is, what would I say? I'm saying what I'm saying is. Let that cause us to do introspection. In other words, you can judge me for everything you like. And people do. Oh, he did this. He said that. You, did you see him? He went in that restaurant and sat down and drank a beer. Uh, you know, I mean, I oh, he's a preacher. He should not <laughs> only do that. Yeah. I heard him say a, a bad word. He said a cuss word. He said it from the pulpit. Yeah, uh, I, I get all of that. You know, and people are really quick to criticize or to judge me. And I understand that. And, you know, if I put myself in this position, then I probably need to have that criticism or that judgment. But I'm saying none of us has a right to judge anybody. And that's one of the basic things that Jesus taught, just basic one-on-one. -on -one. Do not judge, period. You might observe. You might see people do things or whatever. You have to realize they have to deal with that. You don't. You can't. Well, then if you take that type of teaching of Jesus, something the church sure didn't go by, said if you got a problem with somebody, you go to them and talk to them. Absolutely. Don't you go and talk about them. Yes, go to them. Well, go with me to one passage, and I'll quit. I'll just kind of disconnect with this because what some of the reasons that I do Gematria, I do these numbers, is that I want you to see the harmony of it. That's what I want you to see. That the harmony, many times if you can see the harmony behind it, you can say, oh, okay, so the pattern is this. The pattern, the word pattern in Hebrew is tabuth, and it's actually referring to you and me, the stick man. Numeric value, that's, that's what I look for. So this word we just got through looking at, the Lord, every that proceeds out of the Lord and I'm trying to get you to understand, Lord, because of religion, the word Lord become Jehovah. Religion did it. It became Jehovah, and then it became the national deity for Judaism, which is a religion. It's not, it's not Hebrew. It's a religion. And they call them the Hebrew people. And then they say that they are the chosen. Well, I did a teaching on the chosen God several years ago. And when you begin to look at the word chosen, and you realize there is no one that's not chosen. Mm -hmm. Color doesn't matter. Hair texture doesn't matter. Everyone who breathes the breath of spirit is the chosen of God. Here, this one place, and I'll, I'll kind of unhook here. Verse 4. 
the, uh, Genesis 2, 4, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God. You see those two words? They're put together right there. And those two words, Lord God. And the combination of these two words, this one right here is Lord. And again, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. It's the, it's the compilation of those chemicals with this one right here, Alif, Lamid, Hay, Lav, Final, Mil. If I take, this is the word Elohim right here. Alif, Lamid, El, Hay, Yod, Mim, Elohim, Elohim, Mim, Mim is like putting an S on the end, or it is plural. It means it's plural. So this word Elohim means plural powers. If I do the gematria, this has a 600 value, this has a 10, this has a 5, this has a 30, this has a 1. Total 7. The pattern. Same thing. Elohim. This is Elohim. The pattern. It's everywhere. It's just constantly looking at us. It's just constantly showing itself to us. Over and over and over again. God's showing us, us. Showing me, me. Why? So that I can learn to appreciate me. I can learn to own me. I can learn to be me. I don't have to be who you want me to be. I can be who I'm meant to be. And that's what we should be. If we do that, as we, the more we can begin to do that, the more we can work it, honing that out, the more we'll begin to perfect ourselves. The, the more we will work through our little idiosyncrasies. Are y'all working through them? Mm -hmm. I am. It's, it seems like it's a constant work, you know. It seems like, oh, I got that one worked out. Wow, here's a bigger one. <laughs> you right now? Okay, oh God, I'm... You know, remember I talked about it, it's like you take two steps forward and one back. Have you ever done that? Mm -hmm. I said, that's what dancing's all about. It's not a mistake. Moving forward or backwards or sidestepping this way on a dance floor is not wrong. And that's exactly what we are called to do, dance with God. Dance through this life experiencing the things that God's called us to experience. Oh yeah, there are many things that don't serve you, that don't serve me. There are many things that I do that are to my detriment, that harm me, that take away from me, that steal from me. Oh yeah, they are. But that is life. That's a part of what life is. It's a part of we learn. You have to learn at your own pace. You have to learn at your own speed, and everybody does. You have to learn those things that serve you, those things that don't serve you. Those things that work for you and those things that don't work for you. You have to do that. Nobody can do it for us. Nobody can make you do it. It's your own pace. It's, it's God's gift to you. God gave us something phenomenal when we were being formed right here in the womb of our mom. The temple being built without a hammer and saw. No sound at all. This baby beginning to grow in the womb. And then when he pushed it out, I said, okay, the, ta the temple, the tabernacle is ready. Pushed it out, I'm moving into it. And you know what he brought? He gave you this. He gave you a gift called mind. And then many times, we don't have a clue what to do with it. Has yours ever run amok? <laughs> Has, your, has yours ever gone on a tangent? <laughs> huh? Every day or every other day it just goes on. Just <laughs> yeah. That is a marvelous gift God gave it to you. And he said, it's not, it's not, to, I didn't give it to you to curse you. <laughs> I gave you that marvelous mind to bless you. And yes, I feed thoughts through it. Of all kinds. You see, mind is like a river. See, just like the astrological sign. Did you realize the astrological sign is a river in the sky? And do you realize that in the, the, the galaxy is just like a river? It's like a serpent. A serpent swimming in the, in the vast space. 
of nothing? And do you realize the book of Ezekiel, we talked about it a week or two ago, we wanted to get into it some more. The book of Ezekiel, the main theme of that book is the Son of Man. More than any other book in the Bible. Ezekiel, that's the theme of it. People want to use that book to say that it's a projection of the things in the future that are going to go up awry and God's going to have to come down here and kill everybody and burn the earth up. You know, That's not true. It's about you and me. And when it starts out, he saw a wheel within a wheel. He saw all these monsters and all these different things, four-headed beasts and all that. It was you and me. These are the four heads. These are the four rivers right here. And, and, and they are what create you and me. And in this, and Ezekiel said, said there's all manner of fish that swim in the river. In other words, there are all kinds of thoughts. You don't have to think them. Actually, if we can learn, and I, and I am pointing my finger at me, if we can learn to just be an observer of the thoughts, not just pull them in, not just reel them in and just eat them up and then try to produce them, but observe them. You're like, wow, that, that thought, I'm going to let that swim on by. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to where you can be, we get to a point where we can say, oh man, I saw the, I saw the most phenomenal parade. And I mean, it was all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and it was my own thoughts. <laughs> That's exactly what Ezekiel was saying. Because God gave us this marvelous gift called mind. And he gave it to us to use it for our greater good. And many times, I don't know about you, I'm talking to me. Many times I use my mind to beat the hell out of myself. To tear myself up. To beat myself down. To show myself for sure I ain't worthy. <laughs> for show myself for sure I, I didn't do it, can't do it, and maybe never will. But I don't have to do that. I can observe that and say, wow, that was a really weird looking thing and just let it, just let it swim on by. Because it's just a thought. That's why I say I said this very clearly, let my thoughts be your thoughts. That's why Paul said in Philippians, very good, whatsoever things are pure, just, lovely, of a good report, think only. Because you, can you think of other things? Absolutely, absolutely. Because you see, you will give preceding words. You'll give, you'll give things that proceed with those and create your own creation. And that's not wrong. I mean, that's not bad. I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I'm saying that's something that we do and can do. I want to read you this out of this beautiful book, uh, which is a... And if you'll notice, I, I write... I write in these, especially books that really resonate with me, they'll stir a thought, and I will write out of that thought. So he says, he's talking about Scripture, he says, it speaks in the language of meaning forms. This kind of coincides a lot with what Bruce was talking about. Okay? Listen to this. He speaks in the, and Bruce didn't have a clue what I was going to share. He didn't see my notes. He speaks in the language of meaning forms and not in that of words. Now if you and I can learn to see that in Scripture and realize it's not words, it's meaning forms. You will begin to look at it and <laughs> see it differently. You begin to see the patterns. You begin to see things. An object or a process from the world of nature conveys a graph of meaning that often could not be elaborated in less than a thousand words. So there's not any way that I can use words and describe the moon that I saw this morning. Right. And I not only saw it, I experienced it. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote this. Words, Bibles, books, spiritual literature, and so forth cannot say what nature can display. You can describe a sunset, but words cannot display the beauty and the grandeur of the sunset. You can describe an apple tree blooming with its beauty or how the flower falls off and the apple bud comes on. 
and or how the bud turns into the ripe fruit and so forth. We can put words to this, but words cannot explain or display what nature can show us. It can say what I see or think, but may not hear, but you may not hear what I say. I'll repeat that. I can say what I see or think, but you may not hear what I say. You hear something totally different. I, I mean, I know this happens a lot. I, I've heard people say, well, I heard you say. And then they repeat, I, I never said that. Oh, I heard you. It's even on tape. I heard you. I didn't say that. Go back and play it. Oh, I guess it was a little different. Yeah. Let's see if I can read my own writing here. How many of us have got into a discussion over something a friend or a partner said or how a partner said something or at least how you thought that you heard them say something or try to describe something and what you heard them say was not what you Say it. Me and Celeste went through that last night. Happens all the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it. Oh, I, I heard you say that. There's was, a saying out there that says people don't listen to hear, they listen to respond. Mm -hmm. True. Thinking what they're going to say before the person even finishes saying what they're saying and don't hear what they're saying. I, I mean, I'm guilty. I'm not saying, I'm just saying it's important for us to begin to know who we are because we are creators. Mm -hmm. We have this God innate ability and we use it. Many times we use it against our own self. And so learning how to focus this and balance this power, balance my masculine and my feminine. My masculine is always going to be thinking and my feminine is always going to be grasping those thoughts to produce them. And that's how the pattern is set up. That's how the plan is. And then in the physical, material, manifest world, that's exactly how it works with a man and a woman when a man plants his seed in a woman who's ready to receive that seed. They're going to grow a baby. They are going to create a creature. That's the most phenomenal thing that could ever be. But we do it all the time. And we don't realize it. I'm, I'm my own male and I'm my own female. <laughs> I say, how in the world could that be? I know that's a conundrum. <laughs> all is. All, are, all is a conundrum. Okay, any comments, questions? or no? Everybody good?